So today on the podcast, we are now up to the third episode in our series on Disney artist Herb Ryman, a person who specialized in watercolors and drawings and eventually became one of the artists closest to Walt and central to his efforts in Disneyland. Back in our first episode, we looked at Ryman's childhood in Illinois and his desire to study art. In our second episode, we followed him as he moved through art school in Chicago and then moved to California to live with his sister Lucille during the Depression, hoping eventually to find work. And as we left off last time, Herb Ryman had just been hired by MGM to be a sketch artist in their art department. And now let's jump back into our story as we move through the classic years of Hollywood. Within a week of being hired at MGM, Ryman understood the basics of his job, that of a sketch artist who created detailed drawings of sets and props to guide those who built and dressed them. An art director showed him designs, often as a rough set of drawings, and then asked Ryman to create far more detailed sketches to guide production. Though earlier films had embraced ornate sets, sometimes with elaborate furniture, wallpaper, and draperies, MGM had now evolved artistically to a point where the scenic design was now arranged in the service of the characters. That is, set should never call too much attention to themselves so that an audience is drawn to their intricacies, rather than focusing on the actors. A well-designed set focused the audience's attention on the action while subtly contributing to the mood and authenticity of the story. During these early weeks, Ryman handed his drawings off to carpenters, cabinet makers, and woodworkers who developed props and backdrops based on his designs. For larger projects, he worked with an architect who adapted his sketches into a set of detailed renderings. He also created continuity drawings that showed how a scene should look on screen which then gave visual instructions to camera operators, lighting technicians, and stage managers in terms of how to set up a shot. In essence, Ryman was the person who, after receiving an assignment from an art director, created pictorial directions for others who worked on the film. He had an office in the Newcomb building with model makers and painters, but in his room he was alone, the only sketch artist. I had the whole place to myself, he said. Along one wall next to drafting tables were wide windows through which he could see the studio. Outside my office window, we had a flash brick-red exterior of what is called the New York Street. In the evenings, he explored the lot, walking down New York Street, where he examined brownstone buildings. From the front, these structures were beautiful, an East Coast city recreated in California. But if he walked up the entrance steps, the illusion quickly fell away. You open that door, Ryman said, and you see weeds and telephone poles behind. When he stepped around to the back of a facade, he found a series of 4 by 4 beams angled to keep the front-facing structures in place. The main MGM lot, known as Lot 1, had a cemetery, a middle American town square, multiple railroad stations complete with tracks that could support actual locomotives and rolling stock. There was a New England street, a New York dock complete with a gangplank leading to a luxury liner, a village in the French countryside surrounded by a river and a stone bridge, and a southern mansion sited by live oaks, with lichen hanging like lace from their branches. The paint wooden shingles on the mansion had been aged, so the structure appeared many decades old, though Ryman knew this was only an artistic effect. A set of roads arranged largely for flatbed trucks connected one set to the next, but these roads also allowed Ryman to walk as evening light drained from the sky from one back lot area to the next, as though he were on a pleasant stroll around the world. The artistic and craft effort to produce these sets was massive. Not only did MGM manage the main lot, it owned lots around the city, largely acquired through early mergers that featured western sets and land so thick with vegetation, the space resembled a jungle. Behind all of this work, 
was a motto embraced by the art department. You write it, we'll make it for you. For Cedric Gibbons and others, this meant that the studio didn't want writers to worry about stage practicality of their scripts. Writers should include whatever scenes were necessary to create an intriguing story, whether they be aboard the Queen Mary, at the base of an Egyptian pyramid, or high atop the Eiffel Tower. And the art department would design and build sets that appeared believable on screen. Beyond sets that were fully built, Ryman learned that stubby structures on the back lot were arranged for mat shots. Painters created highly detailed images on glass. One matte painting might present the upper portions of a stone castle at the edge of a French village, with only the lower portions built on the lot. Another might feature a sea with distant ships on the horizon. Typically, the lower portion of the glass included an unpainted section, a window through which the camera had a clear view of actors and perhaps a partial structure in the distance. An ocean painting on glass might be used along with a small lake at the back of the MGM lot. Such a painting would be placed before the camera with the clear glass opening just large enough to show part of the lake, a few actors, as well as some sand and rocks. When perfectly positioned, the finished shot presented a believable image of actors walking alongside a vast ocean, complete with ships in the distance. As an artist, like Ryman, penciled out a sketch for a matte shot that included a building, he or she typically left a horizontal line through the image, indicating what needed to be built and what would be created by a matte, often with a reminder, do not build above the line, written in the margin. Around the studio, Ryman found the squat remnants of previous matte shots, the bottom portion of a castle, the first two stories of a skyscraper, a few white columns that perhaps once led to a public library. The remainder of these structures had only existed on glass, but these paintings were long gone, as thick glass was expensive. Once a shot was done, the glass was scraped clean so it could be used for another shot. In these early weeks, Ryman saw how the studio worked as a business. His job at MGM was his first career position, his first time having a permanent role in an artistic endeavor designed to make money. As such, he was interested in its cost structures and how the enterprise paid for itself, how money flowed from the box office to the studio to production areas and finally to his paycheck. He was also interested in the person who led the art department, Cedric Gibbons, the man who shaped the visual style that defined the studio. Cedric Gibbons had been with MGM since the start, a tall man with serious dark eyes and a thick black mustache. He was married to actress Dolores Del Rio and at times drove a luxury Dusselberg sedan to work, a car that was designed as America's answer to England's Rolls Royce. At the studio, he oversaw a dozen departments such as drafting, set decoration, carpentry, painting, and wardrobe, approving their work step by step to ensure that a finished film presented a cohesive, believable, and attractive presentation. When a set of scenes or a short film was shot in color, which was rare in the early 1930s, Gibbons was also responsible for ensuring the colors appeared harmonious on screen from the costumes to the set design to the furnishings. In the language of the art world, Gibbons functioned as the master artist, with those around him arranged as skilled assistants, largely to bring his overall vision to the screen. Ryman understood that his role was a small but important step in the process. He created drawings that visualized how a set was intended to look once built. His drawings were typically done in pencil or charcoal, as there was rarely a need to visualize anything in color. In 1932 and early 1933, he worked on one picture after another, providing sketches to guide the work of architects, set designers, and the prop team. 
On a typical work day, the various art directors and assistant art directors held a 9.30 a.m. production meeting, after which they discussed ongoing projects with Ryman and others in the art department. Herbie, because of his sense of detail and his ability to work with photos, quickly became a favorite of the art directors. He drew elements that were arranged into sets that represented Paris, New York, and the Middle East, all places he had never visited. In ways, he was returned to the artistic experiences of his youth, when he drew animals, landscapes, and buildings that he saw in the pages of National Geographic. This skill, the ability to imagine realistic textures and patterns from relatively low-quality reference photos, was in high demand at MGM. From the start, he liked the feeling of being needed, of having his art valued. Here, Herb, one of them would say, I want this drawing. I want to show them what we're going to do. Sometimes the request for sketches and illustrations piled up on his desk, especially if the drawings required research so he could better visualize a historic setting or a foreign locale. For guidance, he referred to books, magazines, and photos from the studio's research library, so his drawings held a sense of realism. I never refused, he explained. I never said, I can't do it, I don't have time. He found there was a community here, a gathering of men and women who together built the gorgeous artificial world of the movies. I love these men, he said, so I worked all night. I worked until four in the morning. As it was the middle of the Depression, he also felt lucky. Most of his graduating class back in Chicago had yet to find jobs, aside from office and retail work. And there were plenty of men who could take my place and be very happy to do it, he said. He was reminded of his luck at the end of each workday. As he drove home in a used Packard convertible, he saw people out on the streets looking for food and work. His job at MGM, especially with the overtime, gave him more than enough money on which to live. He now had his own apartment, a small villa across the way from the Hollywood Bowl. For the first time in his life, he saved for the future. In 1933, the movie business was still a new industry, a young person's game which allowed up-and-coming artists to quickly establish themselves. In the span of five months, Ryman drew hundreds of sketches and illustrations for at least six films. He worked on two World War I dramas, Today We Live, starring Joan Crawford, and The White Sister, starring Helen Hayes. He worked on a film set in an Irish fishing village, Peg on My Heart, starring Marion Davies. He worked on a film set in part in a half-constructed skyscraper, Fast Workers, starring John Gilbert. He also worked on the late Christopher Bean, starring Lionel Barrymore, the story of a painter which not only featured sets partially sketched by Ryman, but also included eight paintings created by Ryman to represent the work of the artist in the film. Initially, the director, Sam Wood, questioned if paintings done by a young sketch artist would adequately represent the work of a famous, if fictional, painter who painted landscapes of the scenery around him. After examining Ryman's work, the movie's star, Lionel Barrymore, who himself had attended art school in both New York and Paris, said that the paintings were more than good enough to represent a professional painter on screen. All of these films were art directed by Cedric Gibbons, who defined the visual mood of the film with a string of assistants. By this point, Ryman could also see that Gibbons was well respected by most of the staff. The head of the scenic department described him as a handsome man and an impeccable dresser. That impeccable taste extended to everything he touched, so everything that came out of the art department was top rate. Once Gibbons defined the look of a film, his key drawings were broken down by Ryman, who created sketches of individual scenes and sets. Typically, Ryman used reference photographs to ensure the details in his drawings were historically or geographically accurate. As he later explained, he created sketches of 
each scene as it is to appear in the production, and from the sketches, company architects construct the scenery. At times, he worked 20 hours a day rushing to move a picture into production. I helped to design exteriors and interiors and made illustrations for them, he added. And these were all brought before the producer, the director, the cameraman, and Cedric Gibbons. Then we built the sets. One of the first people to join Ryman in the art department was Ken Anderson, a recent college graduate who had studied architecture and art at the University of Washington. Anderson and Ryman were nearly the same age and got along well. Even though they technically performed two different jobs, sketch artist and architectural designer of sets, they worked together. We would get a plan from the director, Anderson said, who would show us around where the cameras were going to be set. We would plan the whole background, how they worked, the placement, and so forth. We decided what needed to be drawn and would make drawings to illustrate these various positions for the director. They had drafting desks in the upper floor of the Newcomb building. Their workspace was ideally designed for the production of art, with one entire wall nothing but windows to let in natural light. Another young artist that Ryman met at MGM was Claude Coates, who at the time was an assistant art director for the great Ziegfeld. This film had originally been developed for Universal, but as production cost increased for this three-hour extravaganza, it was shifted over to MGM. The production brought a handful of artists who also shared workspace with Ryman. Zinkfield was a lavish production with a tremendous budget, far larger than the typical MGM affair. The story presented the life of Florence Ziegfeld, producer of opulent Broadway musicals. As such, this film would not only have sequences arranged in London, Paris, and New York, it would recreate many of Ziegfeld's most iconic productions with indoor sets as tall as a three-story building. Productions like this, Ryman learned, required not only an art director and an assistant, but many assistants to create unique sets such as Claude Coates. Coates was three years younger than Ryman, and like Ryman had studied art in college, he had taken courses in architecture, but received a bachelor's degree in drawing. Unlike Herbie, Coates had taken time after graduation to see the world. Working on the SS President Cleveland, he'd sailed to Hawaii, Japan, and China. As his ship was docked, he ventured into cities taking photos with a small camera. When he returned home, Coates created watercolors of the places he had visited, largely inspired by his own photos. It was this story that stayed with Herbie, how Coates an artist three years younger than him had already had experiences beyond the States, experiences that he had used to create art. Ryman found many positive aspects in his position at MGM. In ways, it was a return to art school. The art directors around him, such as Gibbons, were immensely talented. While younger artists and even some architects wanted to improve their drawing and painting abilities, as these skills could lead to job security and promotion at the studio. Their plan was simple, to hold life drawing classes with a model on a raised platform. The studio was amenable. They provided drawing benches, a model's platform, lighting, and space inside the studio buildings. Uh, so sketching became almost part of the art department, Ryman said, although these sessions were always held on the artist's own time. The sessions improved Ryman's ability, helping him focus on composition, form, and gesture. These skills would be useful not only at the studio, but in his personal work, like other young artists, he was still driven by the drumbeat of art school, which maintained that successful artists presented their own vision, while lesser artists presented the vision of others. Though Ryman created his own sketches, his work at the studio was far more in service of Gibbon's vision than it was of his own. The one exception to this were those paintings he had created to be seen on screen for the late Christopher Bean. But now that he had money and a little job security, he wanted to focus on 
his paintings and drawings to develop his own vision, something that might make those back home proud. During these same months, while Herbie established himself at MGM, his sister Lucille developed her ability on stage. By 1933, she was moving beyond the Pasadena Playhouse. She and her boyfriend, Louis McClune, a producer who had discovered stars such as Clark Gable, agreed to develop a project that featured Lucille, who was now working under the stage name of Jane Starr. In May, she and McClune left California and traveled east where they reviewed scripts at a summer workshop in Mystic, Connecticut, looking for lead roles for Lucille, ideally two roles in two plays. Their plans were ambitious. Once they selected a play, arranged a production, and then after a week or two of previews, McClune and Lucille planned for a 10-week season in New York and thought of afterward taking the production to London. The first barrier to these plans arrived while they were in Connecticut. They didn't choose two plays, as initially planned. They found only one, a three-act comedy called It Pays to Sin. The story, adapted from a Hungarian script, had a promising and potentially spicy premise focused on two unlikely characters. A timid doctor who has written a successful scientific treatise concerning sex but has never in his life been in love and a girl who falls in love with him, which was the role to be played by Lucille. Together, they reviewed an English-language version of the play in Connecticut and also cast roles. Once the play was in reasonable shape, McClune booked the Selwyn Theater in Chicago for an out-of-town preview in October. This was arranged around Lucille's other acting job that summer. In September and October, she would take over the lead in a midway demonstration at the Chicago World's Fair called See How Movies Are Made during the fair's recently announced extended season. The show at the fair focused on the technical merits of film production, including uh, the use of sound equipment, microphones, lights, and cameras. Her work during the day allowed her to rehearse Sin in the evening, but this production, clearly working through development problems, canceled the Chicago engagement and chose instead to open on Broadway, a risky move for an untested production. A play that opened outside of New York could use reviews to revise its efforts before debuting in the city. But without a preview run in Chicago, It Pays to Sin would essentially have one chance, one night, to convince theater critics that it was a worthy production. 1933 was a difficult year to launch any theatrical production as theaters across the country and especially in New York struggled to fill seats during the Depression. At the Morosco Theater on 45th Street in New York, Lucille's stage name appeared in lights above the box office. But Lucille and McClune must have known the play had problems, as its premiere was delayed at the last minute from Wednesday, November 1st to Friday, a few days after Ryman's work concluded for the fair. It pays to send was handicapped with a string of poor reviews, some of which singled out Lucille's work as underdeveloped. The New York Daily News said that Lucille was a comely young person of wholesome appearance and evidently limited stage experience. The Times Union of Brooklyn was less kind, calling it a completely depressing mediocrity. The least kind, though, was the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which proposed that Lucille's introduction as a star is an insult to the intelligence of someone, the intelligence, say, of the theater-goers of Metropolis. The play closed quickly, racking up a loss in terms of set production travel and salaries. The reviews were so painful that after reading them, Lucille understood that her future did not lay on the stage, but perhaps in one of the back-of-the-house roles, such as directing or producing. After leaving the Morosco Theater, Lucille returned to a traveling version of How Movies Are Made, 
which appeared in Pittsburgh seven shows a day, arranged on the fifth floor of Gimbel's department store. The production was coincidentally paired with another movie-focused exhibit from the fair in which artwork from the Disney studio demonstrated how animation was produced. She returned to Los Angeles by the beginning of the new year, where she and McLoon produced plays around town and in San Francisco. When productions went poorly, Herbie helped support her, much as she had supported him two years earlier when he first arrived in California. At MGM, Ryman saw a production shrink, which was blamed on the economic depression that just wouldn't end. As a result, MGM laid off some members of the art department, including Ken Anderson, promising them that they would be rehired when there was more work. Ryman also saw the structure of the studio change as Irving Tholberg, due to ongoing health problems, took a leave of absence as he could no longer manage a full production schedule of roughly 50 films a year. His problems were related to a lifelong heart condition, a rumor that leaked out into some newspapers, including the New York Times, but the studio PR department claimed that Tholberg was merely suffering from a flu relapse and that he was expected back at work within three weeks. Those three weeks, however, turned into six months. During his absence, Thalberg kept his office and he still officially managed MGM, but he convalesced in New York and later Europe. This break was the first step away from the mayor Thalberg partnership that had defined MGM and the MGM style for years to keep productions moving forward, Louis Mayer promoted assistant producers previously working under Thalberg to positions where they oversaw their own units. He also persuaded his son-in-law, David O. Selznick, to join the studio, where he too managed a unit. Selznick had grown up in a New York studio family. Selznick himself had worked his way up from the story department to a management role at Paramount, then to a studio chief at RKO, where he produced a number of successful films, including King Kong, and by doing so was seen as a near equal to Thalberg. When Thalberg finally returned, he no longer oversaw all production. Instead, due to ongoing health concerns, he oversaw a single production unit and produced a few films a year. In August 1933, he said, I shall organize in our studios a production unit that will make as many pictures as I'm capable of making. In practice, Thalberg understood that MGM, in his absence, had progressed into a series of fiefdoms, with a half dozen producers overseeing their own films, but there was clearly a hierarchy. At the top of the heap were Irving Thalberg and David O. Selznick, who typically developed the most expensive and elaborate productions. The best artists, craftspeople, and technicians were typically assigned to these units. During these years, Ryman's work was often associated with either a Thalberg or a Selznick production which spoke to his growing significance inside the art department. The assignments now that came to Ryman were more complex. He used photos, paintings, and other reference materials to produce surprisingly detailed drawings of locations he had never visited, such as 18th century Paris for A Tale of Two Cities, a Selznick film. This was also a film based on a novel written by Ryman's distant relative, Charles Dickens. It was a film that required multiple art directors. Beyond Cedric Gibbons, two rising stars, Fred Hope and Ed Willis, oversaw large sequences of the film. I laid out and designed most of The Tale of Two Cities, the French part of the thing, Ryman said, which was constructed by our studio construction people. Beyond a sense of historic realism, Ryman knew how to develop sets so they enhanced the mood of each scene through strategic use of color, shapes, line work, and light. 
By this point, he wasn't just recreating a place. He was visually interpreting it. He was creating sets that invited viewers into an emotional space, one that spoke to the overall mood of a film. For the French Revolution, which was the film's climax, he progressed beyond a simple production of the Bastille. He textured the space so that it radiated the emotional themes of anger and despair. The Paris set for Tale of Two Cities was an exaggeration of the revolution, Ryman said. The Bastille, it was more than the Bastille. I remembered the research that I had were steel engravings, but I thought... Where do we go from here to make this a little worse, make it a little darker, make it a little more menacing? The production was shot on existing backlot locations, including an area called the French District with its long row of shops and the French Courtyard with its alleyways and public square. But the most dramatic scenes were arranged on a backlot area previously known as the prison. For earlier films, the prison presented an imposing structure with high beige walls. But for A Tale of Two Cities, these walls were redressed to make them appear like the cut stone fortress of the Bastille. Five stories tall, now outfitted with a drawbridge and a slat iron gate. During filming, the Bastille set was filled with thousands of extras, all wearing the costumes of French peasants, many raising sighs and other farm tools in protest. If Ryman was ever confused as to the grandness of work at MGM, this moment would provide clarity. No other studio or theatrical operation had the means to present drama on this scale, with a massive swarm of extras reenacting the start of the French Revolution in front of buildings that were a near match for those that stood in Paris decades ago. Another production for which he was able to interpret the environment for emotional effect was Queen Christina starring Greta Garbo. Set in the 17th century in Sweden, the film tells the story of a queen who takes the throne when she was just six years old, after her father was killed in battle. For this film, Ryman created a large sketch. Uh, depicting the somber drawn upon the battlefield and comprised as great an effect of drama and macabre mood as I was capable of creating at the age of 22. While he worked on this sketch, a drawing that measured 30 by 40 inches, a middle-aged man walked up beside him and admired the work. The man was American artist Rockwell Kent, best known for the art he produced while traveling to Alaska and later the Arctic Circle. Kent's work was featured in magazines and books. He was the exact type of artist that Ryman had once hoped to become. Eventually, Kent asked questions about Ryman's sketch. Ryman explained his research process and how his drawing would influence the film's production. I had no idea, Kent replied. Such thorough research and finished drawings were needed in the film industry. Kent might have been even more impressed had he known that Ryman would also create a portrait of Garbo used in the film with Garbo arranged as the queen. For another Selznick film, David Copperfield, Ryman worked on sketches that would create not only new sets, but permanent new streets. For this film, MGM authorized the construction of two areas that would resemble 19th century England with detailed stone and woodwork. The areas would be known as Copperfield Street and Copperfield Court. By this point in his career, Ryman was essentially laying out productions. His sketches done in pencil and charcoal for Copperfield showed foreground, midground, and background elements, as well as the placement of lights, cameras, and dress extras. In 1935, Ryman created sketches for Romeo and Juliet, a period romance produced by Thalberg. This, too, was a huge production, again involving multiple art directors to create a period romance set in Italy. Along with Gibbons, Ryman again worked with art directors Fred Hope and Ed Willis to develop the style of this film. 
To increase the visual realism, MGM had sent a photographer to Verona, Italy to take reference shots that Ryman and others used to design the sets. The production was so large that Thalberg asked Gibbons to create a new shooting location called Verona Square, even though the studio had other sets that could be dressed to resemble Italy. This new set would be a four-sided structure, meaning that camera work could be arranged from different angles. The set included fountains, cobblestone streets, enclosed colonnade walkways, and a church. In working on this film, Ryman was again coming to understand that he was repeatedly creating drawings of places he had never seen. He was an armchair tourist, an artist who assembled his work based on images produced by other people. These concerns weighed him down now that he was in his mid-twenties. He was no longer concerned about money. He had savings. His sister Lucille was also doing well. She had traveled across the country as an actress and now hoped to work in the business end of stage productions. She was also engaged to Louis McLoon, the theater producer. During these months, Ryman was wholly focused on his work at MGM, to the exclusion of most everything else except for his mother and his sisters, and at times his own efforts with painting. He was aware of projects at other studios. He knew that two of his friends, Claude Coates and Ken Anderson, were now working at the little Disney studio on the far side of town. He'd seen some of their cartoon shorts, such as The Goddess of Spring and The Grasshopper and the Ants. The art style leaned toward the type of rounded characters one might find in the funny pages. In ways, the Disney productions were a narrative extension of silent pictures. There was often a Chaplin-style comic, at times a Valentino-style romantic hero, and of course a melodramatic villain. Though live-action productions such as those at MGM had used sound to create more sophisticated characters through nuanced dialogue, animation had used sound to create dance numbers and comedy, which somehow to Ryman seemed a lesser art form. Ryman was also aware that young artists weren't always treated well when they first arrived at Disney. His friend Claude Coates, once an assistant art director on a major film, initially believed that at Disney, he would paint watercolor backgrounds overseeing all aspects of the image. But his first assignment was to finish a painting started by another artist. Specifically, he was asked to complete the tedious brushwork required to create lines of shingles across the roof of a house. The painting was used in a cartoon called Mickey's Fire Brigade. But Ryman could see that Disney was making inroads into popular culture. For Ryman, oddly, it wasn't the animation that made the impact. It was the music, such as the song Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, featured in The Three Little Pigs. Who's Afraid was a hit on radio, a song covered by popular singers, and featured in nightclubs. It was a type of national anthem during the Depression, as its lyrics suggested that people might overcome their current troubles with the help of community and a plucky attitude. It was a message of hope wrapped up in the musical notes of comedy. Though Ryman had seen the cartoon, he had heard the song everywhere. It seemed to be symbolic of something, Ryman said, and people would whistle it and sing it, even at MGM. In our sophisticated art department, we'd sing it and whistle it. Animation, overall, was still far from Ryman's mind, as a production system that didn't particularly interest him. And why should it? Around him were lakes and jungles, castles and skyscrapers, or at least the lower portions of such buildings. The back areas of Lot 1, that is, the main lot, were a set of curved streets and cul-de-sacs that presented a French village, a row of New England shops, a Spanish hacienda, a road in Ireland, and a waterfront dock. 
It was, in ways, a physical recreation of a National Geographic issue, a set of photographic articles arranged into a series of backlot sets, pieces of the world brought together through artistic skill and years of effort. And if these backlot sets weren't enough for a particular film, the studio owned a thousand or so tall backdrops and other scenic elements casually called flats that were stored in covered docks at the far end of the lot. There was something wonderful about the backlot sets at MGM, a gallery of art arranged for film production. But for Ryman, the sets, wonderful as they were, reminded him that just as when he was a kid, he was still looking at visions of the world arranged by someone else, and that the reality of these places existed far from the cities where he had lived. I'll be back next Sunday to continue our story of Herb Ryman, a key artist who helped define the look of Disney films and the Disney parks in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and far beyond. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. You can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find over a hundred episodes not available on iTunes, but the best reason to join is to support the work we do here. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.